Okay, so this is how you get into your own community edition. Okay. Um, is, um, is everyone with the community edition here? Okay. So I'm going to show you lots of things, okay, today. Um, I'm also going to show you this other resource we have, which is the research cluster, right? Because um, those of you who are enrolled in the course definitely have to do a project. So, um, and others are welcome to try too if you want. So, um, um, so I'll be around um, mostly after Wednesday um, of, of next week. So the next three weeks you can come and discuss with me and um, we can sort of um, decide what projects you want to go into. Okay, um, so what I'm going to do first is, um, because our class cluster is still kind of working, I'm going to do the full demo um, in the sandbox. Okay, so the sandbox basically is what we had for the summer course. So Dylan knows about the sandbox, for example. Okay, so what I've done here is um, essentially uploaded the same thing and um, this should be the notebook. Okay, so the good news is the cluster here is working. Um, so, okay. so I'll use this mainly for, for, um, for demo when we come back here. Okay. So for some reason, this is kaput right now. Okay. Now, so the idea is that each of you will sort of keep learning uh, with the community edition in the future, right? So once you've opened up the community edition from the email I sent sent you, right, then what you can do is um, go here, right? And then um, open this. So this is what this is. Oops, not quite. Um, oops. Sorry, so uh, it's this one, right? This is basically my um, HTML of the notebook. So then if I hit import notebook, then I'll get my URL, right? Where the notebook is. So all I have to do is um, copy this, control C, done. Now let's go to my, your, go to your own community edition, like this one, and then, um, Right. There's no clusters here. Um, so let's just say we're going to create one. Um, so of course, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the community edition. There is training. The new courses are starting. So this is the CS101X. This is, I think, uh, uh, AJ's course, which we kind of weave partly around. I think Amit's course might be here too soon. Okay. So in my own chat thing, I put, I put this particular um, this particular um, thing, but you won't be able to see uh, what I have. So I'm going to just go to my own home and I'm going to just create um, a notebook. Yeah. Okay, so that's in the, in the, in the um, home page. So let's say week seven um, LDA. And I'm going to choose Scala because it's a Scala notebook. Okay, so this is, oh, yeah. So this is just basically as usual. Okay, ah, so now I have to um, launch one. Okay, so let's see what happens. I am completely trying this right now. So uh, I think it should start. So the next thing we want to do is actually um, um, import and then URL and okay 
So I'll tell you, Andre, where this is from. So this is, so I'm going to just take this import and hope that will just come up. Um, so that's here, Andre. So if you go to the course um, URL, week seven. So this is, right, this is just, uh, so this actually is, uh, if you go to Apache Spark Meetup, this is the shortened Google URL will take you here. Yeah. Instead to um, run just after the uh, attach one cluster, the step to import, not to uh, where to be part of the um, but so in the, in the, sorry, okay, Andre. Is it, um, so this URL is the main course URL, so it's everywhere, right? It's in a shortened form in the Apache Spark Meetup and whatever. Um, Okay, good. So now let's just go back to the community edition here. Uh, sorry. Um, here. Okay. So I just imported the HTML and, the, and, the, and it's here, right? So that's basically dump me right here. 025 LBA news group small. That's our worksheet for the week, the notebook for the week. Okay. So there's going to be lots of things that won't quite work. Um, because of run commands and things like this. So, um, so we'll, we'll sort of um, slightly work around it, okay? So there's a cluster that started for me, right? Because I sort of did one plus one and I said, just do it. So it's, a, it's pretty decent. It's a six GB, I think it's got a couple nodes or something. So not a very powerful cluster, but enough to learn hopefully. So I'm gonna connect to that. Okay, so you should all be able to do this with your community edition as well. Now, uh, be mindful, uh, don't run this um, frame it thing because remember, um, this is actually um, assuming that you have a directory called scalable data science at the, so at the workspace level. So but you don't need to run it because the HTML already has the stuff that um, was related before, so um, so let's not worry about mucking with this. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is um, okay. We'll talk about what LDA is and all that in a minute. But what I'm going to do for those who are in the community edition is this whole process of getting the raw data. So we're going to go get this news groups data. It's going to take ten minutes. So I want you to start the process while we start talking about the theory. So these are people who are in the community edition. Okay, so these instructions are all the way in the bottom. So let's just go down all the way. And this is downloading and loading data into the distributed file system. So I have not tried this in the community edition. It definitely isn't there, right? Um, so it basically says if you're in a new shard, then you need to do this. So let's just, okay, I'm just doing a wget of this um, news group data. So let's see what happens. Okay, I fetched it. Good. So now I want to untar the file and dump it into a directory called temp folder. So, yep. I tar um, x is compression, v is verbose, f is file, and z is uh, um, gc extract verbose file. Um, compressed. So I've done the, the compression and I put it into slash temp, okay, a local folder. Now, um, this is the one that takes about 10 minutes. Now I'm going to use the um, file system copy command, recursively copy all the files in this uh, local temp mini news group folder into the DBFS, data, you know, this weird file, favorite file system, uh, folder called datasets mini news group. And this is actually a, a very interesting problem, why it's taking 10 minutes, but I thought it's good to go through this. This is sort of called the small files problem. So basically when you have lots of tiny little files and then you're trying to put it in a distributed file system, each file, uh, because it has its own name, it's a unique file, 
It needs to be stored in the distributed file system, Hadoop-like system, with a lot of metadata about the file itself, okay? And Hadoop is really optimized for large files, so you know, it sort of breaks big files into blocks of certain default sizes that are fairly big. So when the files themselves are small, there are actually better ways to deal with it, but right now I thought, okay, 10 minutes is not bad. And this is the kind of thing you, you, you sometimes, uh, um, you know, uh, 10 minutes is okay, you know, it may take you like two hours to figure out how to do it, so, uh, you know, in three minutes, so, but it's not a big deal. Um, so let's, so I hope all of you are doing this. Once this process completes, what's gonna happen is these tiny little files from the local directory in the master node are going to be copied in a distributed way into the DFS. So then once that's done, we can read really fast, right? Because all of, all of the worker nodes are going to start reading uh, from the DDFS. So, so this kind of initial loading is, um, yeah. And then once that's done, then you should be able to display dbutils, fs, and, and then continue with the rest of the worksheet. So we should just work, okay? So let's see, that's, um, so I'm gonna kind of keep this running in the community edition and then drop back into the sandbox right now. Um, so, so you may have to just sort of follow along here. Okay, so we have a cluster called brass stacks. And um, let me try to also point out one more thing, which is here. The other resource we have that's extremely good and it's a good opportunity, honestly, to take advantage of is we have a research cluster as well under this grant. Um, the research cluster allows us to go up to a thousand nodes if we want, because we have pooled resources from the AWS Educate grant, we can actually push the limits, but, but then you need to do an interesting project if you, if you want that. Um, so you may not need this much resources, right? So where is the research cluster? There's a URL to this somewhere here. Um, just give me a second. Uh, um, Ah, oh, there it is. So this is just a uh, new names into Sinodine Canterbury Research .cloud .com. So I haven't given you access to this yet. So you need to first come and talk to me about your research project, and then um, we'll go here because you can kind of blow the cover here. You can you know increase your own number of nodes and things like this. So you have to administer as well a little bit. Okay. So, okay, so that's sort of the third main resource, right? So let me show you, I think I started a cluster here, um, Stacks Research, it's running. So let me just sort of show you, um, it's basically once you start playing and doing your project and you've given the AWS credits already to me, um, then we just have to monitor what you're doing. So we can say temp, whatever. Um, usually we are on Spark 1.6. And on demand is more expensive. So usually I try to do spot, right? So the spot price is, is a little bit cheaper. And then we can fall back on on demand. So if the spot prices go above our threshold, then it'll fall back automatically on the on demand one where you pay slightly more to keep computing, okay? So that's sort of what we will do. And then, you know, this, this is gonna depend on what you're gonna do, right? So we can just keep going. The number of workers, you know, I think there's upper bound of, well, okay, there's an upper bound on the AWS and in case somebody goes crazy and puts a thousand nodes here. But, but the idea is that we can, we can actually keep scaling up, okay? So say Dylan wants to do something where he puts the, um, I don't know, say the OpenStreetMap 
um, entire world's OpenStreetMap database in every single node. So say he wants to do some kind of map matching simultaneously on different parts of the world independently, you can do that in the system, right? So we will go into a geospatial example after the break. Um, <laughs> where we'll show you how to integrate various parts of Spark and Magellan and things like this. Um, so, okay, I'm not gonna stop this because uh, well, that's basically how you do this. And then there's actually more advanced settings here. So we usually choose um, uh, AP Southeast 2C right now because we looked at some historical data and found that to be the, the, the cheaper option. Okay, so you just look at the past spot prices and so I don't think that's Singapore. I think that might be somewhere in Western Australia. But I'm not sure where. Um, maybe. And then you can choose either the memory optimized version or the compute optimized one. And, um, you know, there's some instructions on what these things are. Right? So, um, yeah. Um, so I'm going to cancel now. Right? So that's basically your uh, resource if you need to go beyond just four or six or eight nodes on the, uh, on the, on the other. Um, um, so I'm using Canterbury EDU cloud, okay? So this is the research cloud. Okay, so. Okay, so let's just go back to the sandbox here. So is that clear, the resources that we have at our disposal for the project? Um, okay. Um, so we, we can spend a few more minutes talking about, I, I sort of warned last week, um, those who are enrolled in the course, maybe, maybe can, can um, you know, say what they want to do, um, if they've thought about it. Do you want to, do you have any idea, Dylan, what you want to do? Okay, so you can. Do you want to do you want to come here and just um, because that's sort of part of the project thing. So we, we can spend a bit twenty minutes or so. This today's worksheet is not hard. Uh, yeah, so some of you may know I did the sum project here, and that was working with Spark and doing geospatial stuff. Uh, so I was working with like mapping trajectories onto maps and working with that in various ways. And then a whole lot of frustration was with, with uh, the state of the tools at the, at, at the time. So, you know, I was crashing out, I had to use, I think, versions of Sparks, which at the time was six months old. More, and then, you, know, the, you know, I think at the moment it still was only support Spark 1.4. And yeah, I just want to sort of really build on top of that with the sort of slightly updated tools and the tool I was working with is Magellan, so it, it's uh, a vector-based map representation, but there's also some other tools that are a bit more developed, but they focus on the sort of raster-based map representations. So I'd like, I'd like to look into that a bit more, see if that, you know, compare those, see what pros and cons are, and then, you know, actually decide on what the project's going to be about. But, yeah. And then, yeah, so I'd like to be able to work with uh, more or large open street map data. So when I was working on it, it was about, it was sort of city scale maps. So something like, uh, you know, I think it was New York and San Francisco is what I worked with a lot. And they were fine, but if I could, you know, with the resources here and this sort of thing, if I could push it up to in the country scale, like just a port power world map and do something interesting with that, you know, analyze travel patterns or, or sure. whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's good. So that sounds like a really good idea. So, so Dylan's basically going to work on maybe uh, geospatial, scalable geospatial computing, right? So, uh, so this could be trajectory data. This could be any sort of data that uh, comes from the environmental, um, is it Environmental Science Research Institute, S3? Yes. Um, which is a you know, classic uh, library originally in Java for all of this. So there are a bunch of People working on uh, Magellan, that's the library he was talking about, which uses Spark to uh, extend um, the Java libraries in Esri. And um, these are guys from Hortonworks and uh, various companies that are, that are doing this. It's uh, freely available. The recent Spark Summit in New York, New York 
Uh, this is Ram Sriharsha. So he talked about some of this stuff, uh, the, the extensions. And there's a lot of very interesting developments recently as well where um, other geospatial indexing libraries are being integrated with Magellan um, by the community. So that's, um, that's a good, um, um, good project. And OpenStreetMap is just a voluntary run um, mapping competitor to Google, basically. So, um, and it has very nice uh, structures. And so you can essentially read all the OpenStreetMap data and then turn that into various um, distributed objects. So these could be matrices or graphs or, um, and then Magellan gives you the, 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 the primitives, the, the predicates and the basic Boolean operations you need to just, uh, just you know, do whatever you want, right? So this would be maybe intersecting roads with some other points or finding the, the shortest path in, in, a, in a graph representation of the road or, um, or, or you know, finding the average distance uh, average speed traveled by cars. This is an open traffic I.O. project where people can just download or upload anonymized trajectories of, from their cell phones as they're traveling. And all of that gets chelated in centralized open traffic I.O. And then they basically um, sort of serve the, the average time you would expect it to take at this time of the day in San Francisco, in this rush hour time, in this market, blah, blah, blah. It's a very nice aggregation service, and that's again a, a freely run thing because traffic engineers are involved and because they, they can do science with the data and so on. Okay, so who else needs to be graded? Uh, <laughs> this is a problem, right? This is the part of teaching I don't like. Um, so I don't know, uh, Dominic, do, do you want to go next? And Dominic can actually give us a lecture on all the theory that I'm just saying. You know, Oh, uh, no, I'm afraid I have to go there, so otherwise it's... Uh, <laughs> we'll be on the other side of the class once again. <laughs> we go instead, right here? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so, right. These are my thoughts right now. It may change um, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm thinking of um, creating an opportunity for me to learn about the properties of random matrices. And the application that I have in mind is to do suboptimal low rank approximation of matrices. And this is for the purpose of um, the spectral embedding of um, network graph data. Um, so I'm hoping to explore some of these ideas um, using some of the Functions that are available in GraphX. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, so I don't know if all those swear words make sense to a lot of people. Spectral embedding of graphs, or, you know. Right. So, I mean, basically, you know, if you have a very, very large graph, right, and then um, you know, essentially, so called low rank approximation is somehow looking at the, you know, the dominant um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that object, right, up to some. SVD representation or whatever. So it's a nice interplay between graph theory and linear algebra. So that's what Dominic uh, really likes and he specializes on that stuff. One interesting development, the reason I'm kind of hanging on to not introduce GraphX until the latest possible moment is because GraphX is undergoing quite a lot of change right now. Uh, from what I, um, so I saw the graph frames talk from the Spark Summit East. Did, did, did you guys see this? So graph frames is a beautiful uh, sort of inter interesting interplay between data frames and, 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 graph, and graph. So it, it's a very efficient way to count, I mean, among other things, uh, specific sub patterns, I mean, specific patterns of subgraphs within a large graph, right? Uh, so once you can actually efficiently count, um, you know, um, you know the, the frequency of, of uh, specific patterns of subgraphs in a very large graph, you can do quite a lot with it, right? Um, you know, you can find, you know, specific ways of communication in a, in a, in a Twitter stream. So you take the Twitter stream, turn that into a graph or, or say wiki, wiki, Wikipedia graph, the sort of link graph. And then you can ask like, say you could take the Wikipedia's editor graph and ask very specific questions like who are the most active editors that are actually, um, you know, uh, editing across 
lots of branches of mathematics in Wikipedia, for example. That's a unique pattern. So there may be these, these could be experts who, you know, or people who have expertise in lots of different areas within a field, for example. There may be interest, because maybe as a marketing company, maybe you want to try to pick on them or whatever. I'm just making up some some, some applications, but but uh, and I, I don't know much about graph frames, so I wanted to first learn it myself before I. Um, so graphics is actually very nice because um, it sort of allows you to do message passing, right? So you have vertices, and then you can pass messages between between vertices. This is called sort of vertex programming. So you take a very large graph. Now it's not going to fit into one machine. So you basically have to partition it somehow, and then the, each piece will be basically scattered. And the way it's scattered and all of that, there's a lot of engineering behind it. So there's some, um, I think, I think um, Spark uses the, the vertex cut, right? So they'll take some vertices of this very large graph and somehow use, um, you know, cut the vertices, use the vertices to actually partition the graph. So the other way is called the edge cutting algorithm. So we'll, 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 we'll most probably visit graphics and you'll kind of get an idea of it. But the beauty in graphics is, you know, you can do page rank, which gives you the stationary distribution over um, all the nodes, right? So the page rank is basically Google's um, algorithm, and right? It's, it's um, essentially a markup chain. So it sort of jumps between different web pages, which are nodes, and then the links between web pages are edges. And of course, you know, not all the nodes are completely connected as one irreducible class where you can go from any web page to any web page. So the idea with uh, PageRank, these guys started Google is that's kind of creative is basically they said with a very small probability, I will allow myself to go from any vertex to any other vertex. It's called a random surfing model. It's a random locking. So with very small probability, I go from anywhere to anywhere. And then with the remaining probability, I sort of follow my nose and essentially do what's called a simple random walk on a graph, which essentially means if there are eight outlinks from where I am, then I will choose uh, one, each one of them with probably one over eight, right? So it's this admixture of the two, which gives you some, so then what you're interested in is if I allow a random surfer to keep surfing this way through the entire graph, um, then I have a counter in each node that essentially counts how many times the random surfer has visited there, and then divide by the total number of hops then that's called the empirical uh, distribution, you know, empirical stationary distribution, and that converges to some kind of distribution on the graph. And what you'll get basically is, uh, you know, popular sites will have more visits, basically, right? So that's sort of very rough idea of, uh, you know, the intuition behind page rank, of course. Um, so now graphics implements that using a message passing uh, idea. So this is also called vertex programming. So each vertex will pass a message to the neighboring vertex and then they kind of keep doing it until some, some sort of convergence happens. And once again, that is highly uh, scalable um, way to do this. Um, now, there are, um, Bibi, do you have a plan or Shin? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I am thinking to do a higher order spectral clustering algorithm using the RDD because when you do the higher order, which means you do a cluster not on the uh, matrix, you do a, oh sorry. You do a cluster clustering algorithm, any um, any method of clustering algorithm on a projected space, which is not a, a matrix, it's a higher order. So you do it on a tensor. Uh, then uh, the good thing about that is it can give you some explanation. For example, if you care about the deviance to the cluster center, it can give you indication of which the lower feature space contribute because when we do tensor, we can kind of figure out the rotation metrics which allow you to turn your result back to the original feature space. That some, uh, but the problem with that is uh, the, the matrix is huge when you do the singular decomposition. So it has to be in a distributed data frame. So I'm thinking to writing that package. In okay. <laughs> yeah. That's good. So I mean, um, the really good thing about this is when you guys use the notebook, um, I should sort of 
Um, so basically, you know, we can go and, um, you know, so you, you can do this and I will sort of go through this and correct it, right? So then we can just directly um, link it to GitHub, right? So all the stuff we're doing actually um, can be in GitHub and other people can continue to evolve it, right? That's the idea. So because we are evolving what others have evolved. So, um, so it'll be fairly straightforward and I'll take care of all the GitHub linking so it goes through um, you know, my, my specific GitHub account so it's in a centralized place. So it's basically a book we're trying to write, right? I mean, that's the plan. Okay, so maybe Matt or BB, who wants to go? I don't know. You don't have any problems? I have lots of problems. Right. Um, so Matt's actually a, a, a mathematician, right? Or, um, or he studied a lot of mathematics. Um, and I mean, so you're welcome to do something more theoretical if you don't want to code as well, um, you know, because there's lots of opportunities to to, you know, you can directly edit Wikipedia and embed it. It'll be even better than, you know, doing it here. But um, so you're welcome to do that, or you can read the, the you know, whole set of Spark papers or, or the database papers, um, kind of, you know, summarize that maybe, or so it's up to you. Okay. So, okay, so you want to do something applied. Um, okay. All right, so maybe Matt's trying to avoid, but then BB is going to, you know, you have to come up here, you know. No. Come on. I, I don't really have a clear idea yet. Okay, so, Steve. Yes. <laughs> okay, so who else? Um, so two, two people without a clear idea. Um, ah, <laughs> please, Andre. I have not generalized the idea. Well, you can go and explain, but also. I have got multiple ideas. Um, <laughs> one of them is work-related. Um, it is to learn about custom connector to Spark SQL. Learn about custom connector to Spark SQL um, to offload queries down to the storage. Um, Life-related problem I have got is to uh, put a camera uh, on a field and detect that my horse is in the boundary or it escaped. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, the problem is that the field is uh, kind of separated randomly by a third-party person. And I uh, and this third party person has got some ideas. What's the right place at the current stage for my horse? Uh, so it needs to actually detect automatically somehow that it is in the right place of a boundary defined by third party, which is following some patterns. And I have got um, just interest related project in mind is to. Um, uh, learn about um, so in the recent world of uh, Internet of Things devices, um, there are ways to uh, con collect sensors data and uh, the biggest problem is that the Action, actions users need to take based on sensors data is manual and this is repetitive and uh, for home automation I um, would like to have a system which can detect my personal behavior and actually suggest <coughs> instead of doing me like most of the systems in IOT space have got triggers. So if that matrix goes higher than, let's say if temperature goes higher than that, turn the conditioner. Um, and you need to configure that. What I would like the system to do is to actually collect what I'm doing and offering it later for me. So if it detects that I do, I, if I turn on uh, my conditioner, 
uh, when it's too hot. Next time it actually suggests, and I have got a choice to approve it, and it learns my preferences. Yeah, I think the Koresh could tell you a lot about this. There's various ways of doing this, right? So reinforcement learning is one. It's basically like good dog, bad dog. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't have a chance to think about, uh, about that because you just asked me and I didn't know that I needed to think. <laughs> yeah, because you weren't, here, you weren't here last week. So, I mean, the only problem is all the things like the horse problem. The only problem is you have to sort of submit it before I, I fly, out, fly out of the country. So, so you, there's a deadline for this, right? <laughs> for, forever. No, no, no. Yes. No. Uh, no. Uh, okay. It, it's deal? a course, right? So there's a deadline. So you have to submit the project by, you know, um, you know. I mean, you have to present the project, right? That's like a huge part of your grade. So the last two weeks, you guys will actually be formally presenting it. So formally means you will have your own notebook like this, and you will be just doing it here, right? Uh, well, so I think the yeah the rules are quite clear, right? So you can do it in groups if if it's really big project uh well it has to be bigger than one of my notebooks for a week for example i mean okay because it's gonna get tricky to you know i mean the idea is i mean you know it's say it's an opportunity for you to like sort of have your notebook which is what you've done and it doesn't have to be super crazy right you could do something you know, interesting, like go into the streaming K means, you know, just one step further, for example. Can right? I like implement one of my um, PhD projects? Well, if, if you want, but you could also just use something in the in this park, MLLib, that we haven't seen. There's huge, there's just a vast collection of algorithms, right? Does it need to be solved problem? No, no, no. I mean, it, it's just to show that, you know, you know, you're doing something, right? So it could be, it could be, for example, in the bottom of this, I've sort of given you some projects, uh, you know, suggestions, right? So you can do, you know, remember the the state of the union addresses. This will be kind of a easy-ish project. Remember, there was a PNAS paper that talked about how the state of the union addresses were analyzed by these political guys, you know, humanists we can basically try to do some kind of more fancy topic modeling or even just this one on that, for example, and then see if the state of the union addresses are broken into topics that correspond to time, for example. And there are actually extensions even in, in, um, in, in this clustering library in MLLib that allow you to do slightly more interesting topic modeling. So it can be just a bit more so that you demonstrate to, to the rest of the class that it's not hard to pick up other things from Apache Spark, you know. Yeah, you, yeah, you have to use the notebook. Just because of the, it's because we're doing it in, the, in, the, in this notebook environment, because, or, you know, you, you I mean. It has got certain constraints. Yeah, it has some constraints, right. And uh, if you prefer the, Notebook, I would sit and copy paste classes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's just because the presentation, remember, this is all going to go into GitHub. There's an automatic markdown scripts. I don't know if you've dived into it. There is a Git book that's automatically being made with all of this. So it can be read from in a device independent way. So there's a lot of cascades that I can't feel if you do your own thing. You have to go and descend into the Python of the Spark code that does the, the MapReduce algorithms on the Scala. You know, on, on the Databricks Scala itself to convert it to Markdown, so it goes into GitHub hooks automatically. Yeah. That's the reason. Um, you know, if you stay in this environment, I can take care of all of that. All I'm saying is the project has to be done in the Databricks notebook. Okay, so it's just because. So visual sign of your project needs to be yeah. presented. Technical details can be hidden. Yeah, so I mean, I yeah, I think so. So basically, you know, because I have, I have libraries, right? I mean, we have libraries. You can put the libraries. We have math libraries, simulation libraries, linear, all sorts of libraries there in the jar. Databricks already comes with lots of preloaded jars that are sort of hidden for you. Not, you know, 
but it's just because you have to present it, right? Maybe a 20 minute presentation. So you, you know, you know, it would be nice to use the notebook because then you can do the LaTeX and, you know, embed videos. You can take videos of yourself and put it there. So, you know, that'll be cool. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's going to be very difficult if you just, you know, do a handwritten one or, or do it through another uh, programming interface you're comfortable with. Because, you know, we spent a lot of time getting you familiar with this. So, okay, so that's, um, is everyone covered? Uh, I think there is a, there's another student who is not here. He's officially enrolled, but. Uh, so, Raz, just yeah. out of the presented problems, are they all valid problems for projects? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I don't know about your horse one, that sounds very <laughs> complicated, but, um, you know, it's not, it, you know, remember, you have to present everything in 20 minutes, right? So, in, in the sense that, I should be able to just send into your notebook for more details, right? So you can have links to Wikipedia or original papers in archive or wherever. So it should be a very tight, you know, I mean, it should be, I'm not asking you to invent anything new, right? It's just uh, you know, sort of lecturing basically, right? It's like this lab lecturing or whatever you want to call this. Okay. And then it's done, right? Because the written part is there, you're presenting the written part orally, and then, um, you know, in grade, um, right? But, um, okay, I think there are a couple more people who may be interested in the project. Um, are you gonna have time, Rania, you think? Or maybe in the future you will do a project. Um, what about you, Tina? I don't know. You don't know yet? or. You might be interested, but we'll wait for the break. So okay, yeah. Are you interested in anything specific? Any? Um, I have some things in mind, but just yeah. not, not very clear yet. Okay. Um, and I don't know about Stephen. Um, do you think you'll be able to do a project or? Why? Well, I think. Yeah, I don't know how to do it. Uh, I don't have a, a presentable idea now. Oh, okay. So right. Maybe next time I'll, I'll, I'll okay. get to the end. Yeah. Yeah. So these are just sort of observing students who have done all but at least maybe one week. I think Tina didn't do one week. But I, I've been spying on what you're all doing, right? So. It's good. So I basically just downloaded the entire HTML and I can see what people are doing. So, so, so there's homework, right? You're supposed to work on your homework or show that you're doing something. So you follow what I actually I mean, a little bit, right? I mean, I'm not like going into atomic details, but I, I know that difference between if you just clone and if you've done something, you know, just cloning. <laughs> okay. But I, I'll worry about it. But I think most people are, are, are you know, at least the enrolled ones are, uh, doing stuff and, and some of the other observing students are actually doing a lot of work so um, which is good which is you know okay um yeah so this is a very interesting um data set actually i think this is one of the biggest reasons i got into sort of uh, digital humanities or, or whatever this intersection of history and uh computing and humanities so this is actually the proceedings of the Old Bailey, right? London Central Criminal Court from 1674 to 1913. Every single case that was ever there is actually in, uh, in text, digitized in text. So you know what the defendant said, what the prosecutor said, and witnesses said, and it's, it's amazing, right? And um, so we've done a sort of a non, the, so the, this part would be a very, very good project. And whoever is interested in more text stuff, maybe Steve or, you know, would, would be a great contribution to the community because this is uh, celebrated as a sort of quintessential data set for digital humanists um, because of the richness of it. Um, so there's a lot of information on sort of political theory and you know, social evolution, evolution of law, criminality. I mean, um, and um, so here is actually the data set itself, which took a bit of uh, time to get to. So when we wrote a paper about this a while back, um, it's not. Um, so here's the zip, and you can just sort of download this, and you will have the entire um, Old Bailey online in a um, XML form. 
Okay, so let that download. But um, so if you go to, so we've done some sort of non-parametric analysis with this, and it's quite interesting. So the non-parametric analysis we did was basically only look at the data up to the punishment type and the and the and the offense type. So you, you you know stole something and then maybe you got sent to Australia or whatever, right? So so if you just look at the counts of the punishments and the uh, offense and the punishment pairs, and and then we did some sort of Bayesian non-parametrics of that and found very interesting patterns. Um, and you can definitely see say that uh, the sort of basic adage in Old Testament is quite evident in English um, criminal. Um, justice system um, where you sort of, the whole idea of a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, doesn't happen in the beginning, you know. It, it doesn't seem to. So you kind of, it's much harsher and then it slowly, um, it was or much more haphazard and then it slowly becomes a lot more uh, fair in the sort of, if you, call, if you kill someone, you, you, you get killed, you know. You, um, that type of stuff, right? And in fact, the sort of the ideas in the New Testament actually pop up, you know, toward the early 1900s because, um, you know, you know, there was a more emphasis on correction and you know, forgiving and things like this. That's sort of interesting, um, I think. So if you're interested in that, please come and talk to me, but then you have to do uh, some data processing on uh, learning about data processing on your own, because what you need to be doing is um, learning how to use the XML libraries to parse this sort of XML data and um, here is essentially um, what we did. It's a non-parametric view of the civilizing process in London's Old Bailey. Um, so it gives you a, a much nicer setting for a, a non-parametric formulation of this problem, a time-varying non-parametric uh, formulation of the problem. And this is the coarsest resolution, right? So just punishments and offense pairs. But then if you sort of, so we do a lot of model selection and we do some sort of uh, alternatives. So you can kind of start seeing very interesting patterns like here. Um, you know, this is the, the empirical frequencies per offense for the entire period of the old Bailey, right? So these are different types of offenses, breaking peas, damage, miscellaneous theft, and so on. Um, so there's a lot of interesting um, patterns here. I mean, um, so these are some stuff with confidence intervals and the more interesting things are, um, so these are plots of punishment probability estimates per offense for the, for the best model. So we're sort of you know, fixing the number of consecutive years in which we believe the model is not changing. So, and then we, we sort of think that about three years is a good, good, good depiction of the window within which the law seems almost the same, but it's evolving fairly fast. Uh, you know, the way in which the punishment offense probabilities change. Okay, so, and um, it's a lot more detail. So there's some MCMC analyses we've done and blah, blah, blah. But if you look at this type of stuff, here is actually the partitions for the best offense. Um, so what the partition, what we're saying is, you know, initially we just said there is one, one, one punishment and, uh, um, sorry, one offense, and then for that offense, there is a specific distribution over punishments. But then later what we do is we say, there may be a partition over the set of offenses such that all the, all the offenses within the cell of the partition have the same distribution of punishments. So then there's actually um, several thousand possible partitions of, I think, seven offenses. So we exhaustively go through all possible subsets of seven and, uh, and do, uh, you know, sort of um, basically Dirichlet, time varying Dirichlet um, um, non-parametric uh, processes. So what this basically shows is that the best partition is shown here. So around 1674 and so on, um, the partitions for the best offense partition model that can vary every three years with each block preceded by the probability of death that's the punishment within that block as a, as a percentage. So if you did, you know, either damage or kill or sexual offense or theft or violent theft, then the probability with which you got death as a penalty is 38.53. Okay. That's pretty harsh. 
I mean, uh, I mean, it's up to interpretation of what that meant because there was a lot of targeting happening as well. So we're not. Um, and then you know, for for these things, it's um, quite high as well. Breaking piece deception. So what you're going to basically see is that you see these percentages, which is the probability of getting um, that as a penalty. You see now the partitions change slowly. You know, only for um, royal offenses and violent theft, you were um, the probability of death was very high, and um, so it changes a lot. And then toward the end, you see the probability of death as a punishment is very high if you kill someone. It's 1911, so it's already like two for two, five for nine. You know, so it's so you know it didn't happen right away. Right, it's kind of cool, I think. Um, Anyways, and then this is just the second best partition, third best partition, because we have a Markov chain running on the space of all partitions for every three year blocks. So why I'm sort of blabbering about this, because you may want to look at this to get insights of how to do the topic modeling on the text that was spoken itself, for example. Right? And there's a lot of papers about that. So it's a very interesting project for someone to sort of slightly get into and then maybe continue um, you know, doing more. Okay. That's um, that's actually Jasper's master's thesis. Actually. Those of you know Jasper. Okay, so let's go back. <clears throat> um, so what we're going to do now is topic modeling, right? And topic modeling basically is a, a unsupervised clustering uh, method for um, documents, right? And it's a very, very nice way of allowing, say, humanists of today, like historians or um, sociologists or whatever, to, to um, sort of sift through lots and lots of uh, text-based data at once. And the, the original ideas for topic modeling actually comes from 2000 in a paper by genetics by Jonathan Pritchard, who actually shares the same postdoc mentor as me in Oxford. Um, um, Peter Donnelly, actually, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but that was for a genetics application, and then it got modified in the, um, for natural language processing. So what's the task? The task is to identify topics from a collection of text documents. So these text documents could be just uh, the State of the Union addresses every year for the US presidents. Or it could be, uh, in our case, it would be the you know um, 20 different news groups. Right, where they're sort of um, chatting with each other in a, in a news group, and it's just a communication. Um, or whatever, right? It could be all the emails that Clinton sort of has in its archive, right? So if you want to be a historian and study Bill Clinton as your main, main president, you know, presidential historian, it's a non-trivial problem already for Bill Clinton because he's sitting on terabytes of data, right? So historians already have to be natural language processors to help them sort of get them somewhere, and then they have to put on their history hat and actually do proper history once they zoom in, right? So that's the... So how many of you read the papers I sent uh, yesterday, the, the one in Apache Spark uh, meetup? Nobody. Good. <laughs> so all the stuff I'm blabbering is from there, okay? So I strongly recommend reading it. Um, so to get a high-level idea, and then... Um, Okay, so the algorithm summary basically is identify topics from a collection of text documents. The input to the algorithm is a vector of word counts, right? So basically we turn each text document into a bag of words model. That's the simplest one. There are more complicated versions of this. So bag of word just means just take all the words, put it in a bag and shake it, and, and then just count how many uh, words of, uh, you know, uh, the frequency of each word basically. So that's your vector of word counts. And then you can do one of two different optimizers on this. We will sort of um, go through both of them just to give you the full syntax for it. Um, so I think we'll do online variational base first, uh, and then we'll do expectation maximization. So at a very high level, you can just think of this as, um, as, as ways to fit the model. So to understand, what it means to fit the model, we have to have an idea of what the model itself is, right? So the model can be thought of um, as an imaginary generative process. So we'll get into that. Um, so anyway, before that, here are some, some links. Um, so we'll, we'll come and talk about feature extraction when we get to feature extraction part of the stuff. 
<clears throat> so here is the paper um, that I think I uh, sent. This is a nice ACM uh, communications paper, so sort of a, for a general computer science audience, probabilistic topic models. David M. Blay, I think he's in Princeton or something. <laughs> um, yeah, so here are the key insights. Topic models are algorithms for discovering the main themes that pervade a large and otherwise unstructured collection of documents. Topic models can organize the collection according to the discovered themes. Topic modeling algorithms can be applied to massive collections of documents. So topic modeling algorithms can be adapted to many kinds of data. So this is when things get very elegant. Um, so you should be able to take a time varying topic model that's sort of partly supervised to make more sense out of this old, um, old daily um, court, court recordings, for example. Okay. So this, this, the simplest topic model that's nice um, to, to and with a very nice probabilistic interpretation is called latent Dirichlet allocation. So allocation, everybody knows, right? So latent means what? Hidden. Empirically? OK, it's a name. Good. <laughs> I like that. So Derek Clay basically uh, is the name of someone um, that, and it's associated with a distribution on the space of discrete distributions. Okay. So what does this mean? I mean, so basically, um, so you know, you can think of um, um, a discrete distribution. The simplest discrete distribution is for two outcomes, right? Heads and tails. So if I have a fair coin, the probability half it's going to be head, the probability half it's going to be tail, right? So there are two possibilities, right? So I have two numbers. So this, I can call this P1 and um, P2, and they sum to one, right? Because I could have a biased coin. Maybe it's actually slightly more, you know, that we could come up heads. So you can sort of imagine this sort of needles moving around such that the sum is one, right? So one way to interpret that is by what's called the, the simplex, right? So this is basically 0, 1, 0, 1, this is the x and y axis. So any point here, so this point is half, half, right? Because this is half and half. So this point, this red point here, is actually the probability of an of a of unbiased coin, right? So you can think of this distribution as a point in this simplex space. So if I slide this point around and go here or here, I can go all the way to um, you know, 1, which is uh, all tail probability and all heads always. So any of these points here along this line is a probability distribution on two events, right? Now, you can just generalize that, right? So you can say, well, what if I have three events, head, tail, and I don't know, the coin lands like that, because the fat coin, right? And the rim, fat coin, right? So then, you know, you've got, you know, maybe this happens with less probability. Of course, these things have to sum to, sum to one, right? So call this P1, P2, P3. So P1, P2 plus P3 is 1, right? Um, so then uh, how you, know, you can geometrically do the same now. So you now, now put like a little triangle here, right? So this is now 1, x, y, z. So this is now every point on the triangle. So the central one will be 1 third, 1 third, 1 third, right? So that's, um, you know, it's a really fat, weird coin. Right? So it's, a, it's almost a Toblerone bar, right, that you roll on me, sort of. So that's here. And then, you know, if the chocolate density is different, right, it may roll differently. So maybe, you know, it's sort of bottom heavy. So this will be a you know, very high uh, probability that it lands on face number three and uh, a lot less probability that it lands on one or two, right? So that's the idea. So I can sort of move around in the simplex and explore all three numbers that have to be zero or bigger and sum to one, right? So that's your simplex in three dimension. So that's called the space of distributions, space of discrete distributions for three outcomes, right? And four is not too hard, right? Four basically, it's, it's a little more tricky, right? but, but it's doable like, to do some projection. You can think of it as a, in a tetrahedron, right? Points inside a tetrahedron, uh, you know, in the right way. And beyond that, I can't really see, right? But it basically is a bunch of numbers that are some to one. That, that space of discrete distributions um, is there. Derek Clay distribution is actually sitting on that space itself. So for example, 
Um, you know, imagine a distribution sitting on this, right? So I'm just now drawing the contours of this distribution. So it's sort of more concentrated at one third, one third, one third, right? So think of it as like an elastic thing sitting there and that integrates to one because that's now continuous uh, dominant by the bag measure, right? So you, so you integrate to one and you can kind of move that balloon around, right? So if the balloon is really flat and spread out, it gives equal probability to all three because you know that maybe you don't know which, what the true bias is, it could be anything. That's how Bayesians would sort of justify prior belief of what they think is going on. But maybe if you know it's a Toblerone bar, Toblerone bar with very heavy chocolate base, then you'll say, oh, actually, I'm going to move my, my, my prior belief or you know, my distribution on the simplex to something like this because, you know, it's going to roll it. You're also going to come on one side heavy. So that's sort of very high level of, okay? And, and those, those distributions are called Dirichlet distributions, and they have a nice parametric form, and, you know, you can kind of look into that. Um, for details. So the idea of latent Dirichlet distribution is to play, play with distributions on distributions uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a formal generative sense. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, so let's see, let's look at this example. Um, okay, so here is uh, just one document, right? And what they've done is highlighted in pink uh, things that um, have to do with, you know, Words like live, evolve, organism, and so on are highlighted in pink, and that's uh, a topic. So here's your sort of topics, and the, the stuff highlighted in yellow is this sort of yellow topic. So this has to do with genetics. The pink stuff has to do with um, you know evolution, um, and then the green stuff has to do with uh, neurobiology. Okay. And then this stuff looks like it has to do with sort of computers and, and, and programming like data and number. So now what's shown here is that um, this particular um, topic is nothing but um, giving you the frequency of these different um, words, right? How often did gene happen in this document and how often did evolve happen and so on. So now what's interesting is topic essentially takes the frequency of these words and sort of um, sort of um, puts them together, right? So, you, you know, you, you can now say that, um, you know, there is a distribution over words that are topic specific, okay? And that's kind of the idea. Um, so the way you think about this, um, you know, is a so-called um, generative process. So where we think of generating the words in a two-stage process, so this is kind of completely la-la land, right? It's imaginary in your head, a probability model. So then what you're saying is, okay, let me randomly choose a distribution over topics. Uh, first of all, let me decide that I'll say three topics, okay? I fix the number of topics, simplicity, the three topics, and then there's some directly distribution sitting on the topics. If I don't know the propensity of each topic, then I might just say it's just a it's sort of a uniform uh, distribution on the simplex, for example. And there are ways to specify this. And in fact, the default parameterization in Spark is, um, um, is, 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 um, 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 is like that. So then you, you, you randomly choose a distribution over topics, then for each word in the document, you do the following, right? So you randomly choose a topic from the distribution over topics in step one, right? We can, we can go to this distribution and sample from it. That'll give me a topic, right? Um, then what I'm gonna do is randomly choose a word from the corresponding distribution over the vocabulary. So there's another thing here floating around called a vocabulary, right? So here's my word, gene, uh, gene or whatever. Here's another word, compute and so on. So there's a whole vocabulary of words, and then there's a distribution on the vocabulary that is topic specific, right? So I choose a topic according to distribution. Now, given that topic, there is actually, uh, say, there's a red distribution for the red topic, and there is a, okay, a dotted red distribution or a, you know, a dotted red topic, right? And so, so that's essentially, um, uh, part B, right? And then we choose from, and then you kind of pretend that's basically what is going on, right? 
uh, in, in your model. So it's basically reflecting the intuition. The documents exhibit multiple topics. Each document exhibits the topic in different proportions. And then each word in each document is drawn from one of the topics. Okay. And the selected topic is chosen from the per document distribution over topics. And that sort of generative model is actually the forward process. This is where we sort of specified as a probabilistic algorithm. And you can complicate this a lot, right? Just the, the simplest uh, starting point. So here, I think they've sort of uh, done this, and then they sort of genetics, data analysis, and um, evolution or something. And um, here is your um, you know, 96 topics, and then there was a, there was a distribution over, over the topics. And you usually choose, uh, choose the, the, you know, you start with the highest probability topic, the second highest, third highest, fourth highest, and then maybe, maybe you'll stop after a, a given number um, of topics. Okay, so I think, you know, I'm going to, um, I'm going to let you look at this. This is, uh, you know, this is already a, um, so essentially this is the, 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 the joint distribution of, um, of the process basically. And um, okay, so you need to actually specify each of the, um, you, know, you have to specify distribution of the topics and topic specific distributions and, um, and then use the count. The, the only thing you're observing is the frequency of the words per document and then you have to okay, invert this. And I'm not gonna go through this because we won't have time and um, for those of you who know plate notations, this is a graphical model. So I'm gonna just quickly jump here and then we'll sort of do it and understand it from the example. And, Okay. Um, yeah, so these are the main ideas. Just look at the pictures again. Please read it again tonight or whatever. Um, so there's a generative model. And um, Matt or whoever wants to really get into this, uh, read these 20 pages of Murphy's Machine Learning book, Probabilistic Perspective 2012, uh, section 27.3 and 27.4. And in fact, you can, you can visualize the whole thing for, uh, and there are only three words and two topics completely. <laughs> Um, which is good enough to start. Okay. Uh, and please take Kurosha's machine learning course. Um, maybe. Are you covering topic modeling there? Oh, yeah. You are? No, not LBA. Not LBA, okay. Uh, okay, then they'll take it for this one. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is a very high level one for those uh, who just sort of don't want to get into the maths too much, but focus things more from a digital humanist's point of view. This is a very beautiful article, I think. I was totally sold on LDA from reading this. And uh, Chris Thompson in English actually sent this to me, so he was the reason I sort of put this together in a hurry while back. Okay, here are just Wikipedia links, um, topics, uh, what is topics in LDA, and you know, please look at this. It's pretty pretty detailed. The model is here, it's, um, it's the formal formalism. So theta i is the topic distribution for document i and so on, this plate notation. Plate notation basically means this, so there's a word W, which is the only thing you're observing, that's why it's gray, right? And then um, uh, capital N, the, this rectangle means that's the repetitions in the experiment, that's, the, that's where you're getting information from, right? Because the information comes from the symmetry assumption in the probability model, right? Because you're multiplying the you know, product. Because you're, you know, in your, in, your, in your thought experiment, every word that's, being produced in a document is done independently. That's why all those multiplications are there, right? Um, okay, so, okay, these multiplications what I'm talking about, right? So, so that's where the information is coming from. So in plate notation, the rectangles are basically for the number of replicates. So, so N is the number of words, oh, sorry, yeah, number of words per document, and this is the number of topics, um, and, um, and these are sort of parameters and for the, you know, we won't go into this because we need to get into um, typically distribution and conjugate parametric families and it's already quite advanced uh, probability and stats stuff. Okay, so here are the 10 steps 
And um, so Siva and I have to do this in uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> All right, but it's sort of easy, easy, really, right? So you have to, you know, understand the details later, but we'll just sort of mechanically take you through the process. So data set review is here. Um, this is this 20 news group data set, which comes, um, and it's actually a random subset of the original one. I think this was a, maybe it was a Kaggle competition one, I'm not sure. Um, so each news group is stored in a subdirectory with each article stored as a separate file, right? And we're gonna go through these 10 steps. Uh, step one has already been done. Uh, is it? Yeah, it's already been done in the shard, so you don't need to do it. But if you go to the community edition, remember we started running that uh, job there. So you have to do, do the job and that'll take about 10, 10 minutes or so. I think that job was running here maybe. Yeah. So you see, um, Boolean true took 763.96 seconds. So you have to do that for your own community edition. Now let's just make sure that it's there. There you go, right? So all of these uh, files for the different news groups have been loaded into the distributed file system. So you should be able to follow step one in your own community edition and simply continue here. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm gonna go back here. Again. <clears throat> okay, and, and um, what I've done is um, sort of pull the stuff from, this is another nice trick to know. Suppose you want to, um, currently you're using the data from this website, right? And maybe you want to be very explicit about uh, where this data comes from, right? So one nice thing you may want to be doing, especially for those who are going to present it and they have a data set they're getting from somewhere. One nice thing you can do is this, uh, you can copy paste the URL, that's one way to go. But to quickly get marked down on just one command line, all you need is, you know, I went to that news group um, website. So I do wget dash k. This is an option in wget you can use. It'll just download the HTML. And then you can use this program called pandoc, which is like pan documents. It goes from babbles from HTML to markdown, all kinds of things. So if you use pandoc dash f HTML dash d markdown, and then this HTML page you pull down, right? You don't have to use wget, you can go and just you know, just copy the, the URL using the browser as well, save as or whatever. And then um, I'm just turning that into this markdown file, right? So now I have HTML convert to markdown by just two commands. That's, that's how I'm making up a lot of this stuff, right? And then I'm just pasting it here. See, that's all I've done. So if I double click it, I'm percent MD, blah, 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 and I've just pasted it here. Okay, so this is a nice sort of trick to be able to, um, Cool stuff from, of course, the other trick is very nice just to directly embed it, but often um, this won't work all the time because uh, frames may not be supported in the web page that you're trying to. So this is option B, frames are not supported in the HTML then. So what is this basically telling us? It's telling us that um, we have um, the data is uh, text, there are 20 news groups. The data set consists of 20,000 messages taken from 20 news groups. And these are the original owners. It was donated this time. Um, here are the um, uh, 1,000 news that articles are taken from each of the following 20 uh, news groups. Okay, this was the subsampling of the original one. So there is a news group on atheism, on graphics, Windows X, Mac, hardware. So there's a lot of computer-related ones. Um, for sale, autos, motorcycle, there's a bunch of sports ones, um, electronics, religion, Christian, politics, guns, um, space, so on, right? Okay. So each news group is stored in a subdirectory with each article stored as a separate file, and that's what we loaded into DBFS. Okay. Um, and here are some links to the papers. Okay, so some of the news groups seem pretty similar on first glance, right? So we may not want to have 20, uh, top, 20 topics necessarily, but we'll try 20 topics. Um, um, so later on, if you want to improve the, uh, the analysis, you can maybe reduce the number of topics to fewer. So we already did this. So I just 
checking again in this shard and making sure, yep, everything is there. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is use this uh, sc.hold text files method on this directory, right? All the files in that directory. So remember the whole text file method will actually return uh, a key value pair where the first key, the key is the file path itself and the value is the content of the file, right? So if I have lots and lots of little files in a directory, this is a very nice way to read all the files and the content as key value pairs. But then what I want to do is uh, leave out the file paths, convert all strings to lowercase, right? So that's what I'm doing. So uh, the closure here, underscore dot, underscore two, basically says, take me, do me a map so that you take whatever is coming at me. So the first underscore says, and then the dot underscore two says, give me the second element in that two tuple, right? Because the dot underscore two is the second element of the two tuple. So it just basically only gives me the values. Now I can take the values and do another map where I'm just doing whatever comes in, changing it to lowercase. Okay, and then I'm caching it. So done. Right, I'm caching it because I'm going to keep reusing it. So that's my, my string RDD of all the contents of all the files. Nice RDD. So I can count the corpus. So there are, um, oh, it says it'll take about two minutes. Okay. Um, so this is the, this is the, the, remember I told you the files are really small and when you sort of read um, lots of small files from this real file system, it's actually not optimal. So um, this is one of those, those things. Um, there are other ways to actually go around this. This is not the optimal thing to do for this file, for this type of um, input data. So I'll continue. So this will give you 2,000, but once it's done, it's going to be cached and distributed memory across the workers. So we can continue with other operations fast. So I've sort of taken the first five elements of that. And then what I'm finding is that it has, um, you know, various, um, you know, um, so it's an array of strings. So here is my first string and it has information on uh, URLs, news groups, and so on. Um, and it has the message ID, date, distribution, and then after this two line break, it actually has um, some something he's saying. However, I hate economic terrorism and political correctness. Worse than I hate this policy. Somebody's saying something. So, so you can kind of look at this, um, um, whatever. So this is the kind of content there that's being blabbered in the news group. And there's another one. So here's the beginning of the next message. See, comma, this is the next string, and so on. Okay. So the first thing we're going to notice is that um, so we can take um, a random sample, right? So if you do corpus dot take sample, because we just sort of looked at the first five, maybe we want to just. Um, take a random sample, then you can just do this, take sample uh, false comma one, it's going to give you a random sample. So you can kind of look at um, some random instance. This is going to finish soon. Um, yeah, it's just reading lots of tiny little files. And um, so the next thing, um, it's being done this split document by double new lines because we saw, right, every new, new uh, um, item is basically uh, separated from the previous one by two end of line characters. So we are going to basically do that. Okay, so I think it's done, right? So now I can sort of take five and this should not take 158 seconds because of the cache call. Okay. And I can take, so this should probably be a different one, you see. And so I can kind of look at different samples of size one just to get an idea. But what you notice is that there's this double line break before howdy. So we want to kind of throw all this stuff out because we're not interested in this part of the news group information, just the content that's being blabbered. So that's what this is doing. So now I take the corpus and map what's coming in. Um, to this dot split end of line. This is basically slash slash n as end of line character. And then what I'm going to do is 
drop the first part of the split, right? Because each thing. In. So then I don't, I don't have all the metadata on the top. Then I'm going to uh, turn that into a string, right? By having white spaces between them. That's what all of this is doing. Okay, so that's now my split document by double new lines, drop the first block, combine again as a string and cache. Done. So now just slightly paranoid, I'm gonna make sure I still have 2,000 thingies, except now without the metadata. So now I can just do corpus underscore body dot take five, and I can see I only have the, the stuff after the end of line. Okay, so I'm gonna turn this to Siva. Um, do you wanna run like, express? Oh, Sando calling to everyone, right? Okay. Um, MLlib has lots of feature extractors, as you can see from this page. Uh, this is the programming guide in Spark. So you can see that they have lots of uh, feature extractors. And the ones we'll be using are uh, tokenizers. Uh, then we'll be using a count vectorizer. And there's another one we'll use, so we'll get to that. Uh, so what this command does is just uh, take the text from each document and assign an ID to it, just so that we can refer to it later. So that's what we are doing here. And you can see, see it, uh, this line. You have to do control and turn this. Yep. <clears throat> so you can see the ID here. So it's just assigning an ID just so that we can refer back to the documents. And this is the tokenization step where we are splitting each uh, word in the document by a space. Or you can choose the regex that you want to split it against. Uh, you can look at the documentation here. It will give you an example of how this is done. So by so the slash slash w is for white space. You can have more complex expressions that you want to use, any regex expression, and you will split your text according to that. Um, Space. Yeah, it will split it according to white space. So we, so the the text before the white space is considered a word, and the text after white space is considered a word. So you can have your own expressions. Maybe if there are numbers and you want to split by that, or if there are colons or anything like. So you can do that, or if you want to, you know, split it by commas. Uh, the set min token length is, you know, kind of you can guess what it does. If you have a word of length less than four here, it will drop the word. Say a and or all those words are dropped. Um, and set, set input call and set uh, set input and output columns. We've already seen these before, but these are methods in the ML lib that will help you uh, take your data and set the labels to so, uh, those columns. Uh, there's also another method uh, that regex to the tokenizer provides, which can be quite useful, which is called set to lowercase. So we already did the lowercase, remember? So we don't need to do it here, but you can, uh, the regex tokenizer also allows you to, um, you know, lowercase all your words. The reason we, we like lowercase is because um, when you do text analytics, it may not matter if the word is start, word starts with a capital letter or a small letter. You, you might want to treat both those words uh, the same. So in that case, you will want to change everything to a sing single case. Uh, but sometimes, you know, depends on your use case. If you want it, uh, you know, words that are capitalized to be more significant, you can make them the way they are. So now we just transform the text into tokens, split by white space. And you can look at what happens here. So as so rights, for instance, is a separate word and so on. So it's also doing for dot, I guess, here. So it depends on your regex uh, expression. And this is the same thing, just uh, using data frame dot select here instead of display that we used here. So instead of selecting all the columns, we are selecting only the tokens column. And remember this tokens column was what we set here. That's all.
Right, the next is uh, stop words. So stop words are nothing but commonly occurring words that do not add extra meaning to the sentence or, uh, you know, like for instance, I or A or those kind of words, the, for instance, those don't add a lot of value. Uh, by default, these are the set, these are the words that are filtered out for you. So during, due, down, so on, so forth. Um, so where, where did uh, MLF get this list of words? These are a list of words that are used by Python scikit-learn. And, uh, and these are here. You can go to this link. So this, these are the list of words by default. It filters out for you. If you want, you can use this list, or you can use uh, you can use your own list as well. So what we did here, uh, which I'm not going to do, is uh, we are downloading the same set of words and we are setting those set of words here. So you're just displaying those set of words. You, you may have to evaluate everything because it's a new shard. Okay. But if not, yeah, just yeah, do that and see if it's there. Okay. Yeah, see yes. If it's there. See so given that we're doing this stop with the frame, what was the purpose of the min token length? Um, so min token will filter out all words less than that length. But for stop word, let's say for instance there was a word during, for instance, that's greater than four. But so the min token length will filter out the word like dog, which we might want. Yes. So you could have done that just with a stop word. Yes, correct. So it's yeah. Okay. So it seems to me quite well, great. You can definitely change that. Later on. Yeah, it's just uh, we just wanted to demonstrate that that's a feature available in the API. So yeah, it yeah we don't need to do it here, but it's it's just available for us. Okay, just want to make sure that we have the stop words. Yeah. So it's the same set of words, and using this uh, stop words is quite you know simple. You just instant instantiate the stop words remover, um, and if you want, you can set your own set of stop words. So we basically pull the default the default yeah. words and then set that um, as the stop words. Because later on we're going to add to it. Okay. And the last uh, feature realization we do is to take the count of uh, all the tokens we have. So this is the frequency of tokens that Raz was explaining uh, was what was the input to the LDA algorithm, and we do that using this other featureizer called count vectorizer. And you can see an example here. Uh, this is actually quite well explained. So if the input is an array with uh, tokens A, B, and C, and there's another array with these other sets of token, tokens, A, B, B, C, A, when we do a count vectorizer, the result is something like this. This is a count of unique tokens. Um, and 0, 1, 2, you can think of them as a hash, hash or some function applied over these tokens just to make sure that uh, you know, each we, we represent the token with some ID, let's say, okay, and then the number of times that uh, say A has occurred is once in the first array, in the second one it's twice, so that's what your count vectorizer uh, does for you, right? <clears throat> and uh, you can set this uh, additional parameter called vocabulary size, so that'll take only the uh, 10,000 most frequent words. So certain words, if you don't want to take them, you can just leave them. Uh, this is the freak, this is a document frequency. So if your word uh, occurs in a document um, that is less than less than four documents, let's say less than five documents here, then that word will not be uh, included in your uh, count vectorizer. There's also another uh, method, I think it's set minimum term frequency. So if the number of times that a word occurs is less than the term frequency, then that will not be included in the uh, count vectorizer as well. 
And we just look at the results, just transform, take the first one. So as you can see, it's 6,139, and then these are the hash or the IDs for the words, the number of occurrences for each word. <clears throat> right. Um, yeah, I'll hand it back to Ras. Before that, just uh, want to mention one thing here. Uh, this thing says we convert the data frame back to an RDD. Uh, the reason we are doing that is, remember, uh, there are two flavors of uh, machine learning uh, MLlib features and algorithms available to us. One is the MLlib one, which runs on RDDs, and one is the ML-based one, which runs on data frames. So here, since we are using MLlib, we have to convert it back to an mm -hmm. RDD, right? Okay, so uh, LDA also has a flavor that that's from ML, so you can actually use data frames and feed it to LDA, but um, we are using the MLlib one because it'll, you know, not all things that are available in MLlib are available in ML. So this is a nice way to look at how to use the older MLlib version of similar algorithms. Okay, so like, I'm going to just sort of push through mostly the syntax here. So, uh, so we're converting the data frames to RDD, right? So basically, I have my my face class row, um, let's turn it into ID comma count vector, and so that gives me a, a, a Spark RDD these pairs, <clears throat> and um, I'm just looking at the first entry here. Okay, so I've sort of embedded a lot of the uh, um, LDA docs from the programming guide in MLlib. Um, so, okay, so we'll sort of jump directly into the code, but um, most of this information is here. And I've also given some much more uh, detailed instructions on how to descend into the code to figure out things um, we want to know about the code. So, sort of. So the, the main thing is we, there are two different ways of, um, of uh, fitting your model, right? One is uh, EM, the other one is uh, online variational inference. And so what I'm going to first do is um, set my number of topics to be 20. I just chose this because um, there are 20 news groups, so I said 20. You can change this. In fact, that's um, one possible way in which you can improve the algorithm. Um, What's going on to the okay? Um, so then um, we'll set the parameters needed to build our, our LDA model. So, um, you know, set mini batch fraction for the online LDA optimizer is, um, is, 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 is something um, we, we need to do. Um, and the online LDA optimizer, uh, there's a very short three minute video or two minute video I'll play, but um, essentially. It's a way to ameliorate the the, um, the the scalability issues with the uh, with the with the online algorithm. So the online algorithm um, is, is faster than the non-online one. The non-online one basically is what's called variational based, which essentially is um, you know it turns the, the the stochastic optimization problem using MCMC into a, an, um, into an optimization problem, a stochastic sampling problem into an optimization problem. So it has some nice features, but the problem with it is um, um, when the data is too large, it scales linearly with the data. So uh, this online LDA is, um, is, is, uh, is a way around it. It was from 2012. Okay. Um, so I'm basically creating my LDA model, setting the optimizer to online LDA optimizer, some mini batch fraction. Um, so it's sort of looking at parts of the data at a time. And I'm setting the, the number of topics with this parameter k. And I'm only doing three iterations of this algorithm. And, um, and then I have these set doc concentration and set topic concentration parameters. When it's minus one, it uses default values. Then um, later on, I'll show you how to find those default values. Um, so let's look at, um, let's look at, um, 
this thing. It's going to take a few minutes. So this is the online variational base talk, lightning talk from um, MIPS 2010. <clears throat> All right, thanks for that introduction, and, uh, and my apologies. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about a, uh, a new fast learning method for fitting topics in the topic model latent Dirichlet allocation. So, uh, latent Dirichlet allocation, or LDA, is um, a uh, hierarchical Bayesian topic model. Um, it's a model of document collections, and uh, the way it explains the variation in a set of documents is in terms of a set of latent topic distributions, which are basically just distributions over the vocabulary and corpus. So, uh, so in these topics, what you tend to see is that words that have something to do with one another tend to have uh, high probability. So, for example, talking about business might be a high probability. Words like corporation, money, uh, million, dollar, etc. So, what we'd like to do is pick these topics efficiently to very large data sets. Um, so uh, the way that is done is using posterior inference, but uh, unfortunately the true posterior, as it so often is, it is intractable to compute exactly. So we have to appeal to approximate inference methods. Uh, one I'll be talking about is variational case, which is a deterministic alternative to uh, the more commonly used work of Monte Carlo methods. Um, and uh, the basic idea is that instead of trying to sample from the posterior distribution, we're trying to optimize uh, some other distribution that has a convenient form to be as close as possible to the true posterior we're interested in, um, in terms of tail divergence. And the nice thing about these methods is they tend to be fast compared to MCMC methods. Uh, they tend to converge in fewer iterations. Um, but they're still batch methods, and so they scale linearly with the number of documents, uh, and therefore can be slow for very large data sets. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do is not have, is to be able to fit these approximate posteriors to our topics without having to look at the entire corpus every iteration. And uh, the way to do that is using a variant on the, uh, the stochastic gradient method. Um, so it turns out that uh, you can actually derive a, um, uh, I won't go into the details, we'll talk about it in the poster, but it turns out that you can actually derive a, uh, a very simple stochastic natural gradient algorithm uh, for optimizing the variational objective function um, that only has to look at one, or one document or a few documents at a time. Um, and uh, what this graph is showing is basically the progress that, uh, that the, uh, this online algorithm makes compared with the corresponding batch algorithm. The y axis is perplexity, it's a measure of model fit and lowers better. Um, and uh, so this red line is um, the progress made by the batch algorithm fit to just 3% of the corpus, um, and it's, uh, it's slow by comparison to our online method, very slow. Um, and uh, so um, basically this is just a, a very, very fast way of fitting topics in LDA to very large data sets. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this method is that it's actually applicable uh, more generally, uh, not just to LDA, there's nothing special about that. Yet, so look forward to applying to other models. And uh, also just want to mention we've got the implementations of that's in Python on my website now has been uh, incorporated into the uh, the Google Web framework as well. Um, and uh, so please come closer. Uh, it's W18 from the model section. Thanks. Okay. So I thought that would be a lot better than me, you know, going more into it. But actually, um, the, the paper, the, so in the slide share, there's this paper. Um, I haven't read this in detail. I just printed it and looked at the abstract. So, um, so if you want to get into it, that's the place to go. Okay. Um, so now, basically, what we've done. Um, so let's let's look at the top topic indices. So now um, we're basically um, viewing the results from the LDA model, and I have um, my vocabulary set next, which is essentially these words. So these are my little um, sort of um, you know the the, the, the words from the vocabulary, uh, the index of the words from the vocabulary list. And this array is the weights, the, the probabilities, right? So this is giving me the, the, the mixture on, on, on these, these set of words, right? So that's my um, um, topic indices. And then that's my vocabulary list. Then what I'm basically doing here is uh, taking the topic indices and mapping the terms and the term weights by looking at the right uh, word in the vocabulary list, right? So now it tells me that that word over there, whatever integer was 12, 
is actually Windows, and it's, this is the probability, and so on Microsoft. And so now I'm sort of trying to make sense of the output, basically. Right. So I'm not, you know, so I, you know, if so, the way I understood a lot of this, because this is coming from a Databricks guide, is just taking the part machine apart, so you can just look at each piece, what it's doing uh, to understand. So here's a review of the, of the results. Uh, so you can do all of that in one go, um, basically. And that's sort of giving you the 20 topics, topic zero, topic one, topic two, and so on. And here are the, the highest probability words for that topic, okay? So this looks like window Microsoft software, and this is rights article. And, um, and of course, there'll be variation every time you try it because of the stochasticity, so. Um, Okay, so here's basically uh, model tuning. So we're gonna refilter some of the stop words because uh, we're gonna add them. That's why we made the stop word so that we can customize it and add more stop words. So I'm adding article, rights, entry, these kinds of things I think are not relevant to me because these are sort of common words that, that happen for this context of news group articles. So now new stop words by just unioning the added stop words to it. So it's a bigger list. So now I can basically rerun the whole thing with the new stop words, right? Um, and then converting it back to an RDD, same exact process, and I'm creating, um, I'm also now increasing the maximum number of iterations to 10 instead of just three. Okay, um, so now I have in my new LDA model. So now if you ask what are the default values, Ross, what's this negative one doing? Then here are the sort of atomic steps of how to go and figure out the default values. So eventually it will lead you to the source code, which gives you this uh, default values, this one over K directly. Okay. Um, so anyway, homework, try to find the topic concentration stuff. Um, so we're gonna one minute late. So maybe I'll, I'll quickly skip. So basically you can now run the new LDA model on the on our improved list with the extra stop words added with number of iterations increased from three to ten. And once this finishes, we should be able to get the outputs. And then the outputs now look slightly better. Um, so let's see. So here we have uh, Armenians, Armenian, Armenians, Armenian Turkish state power. So I think you know Steve Manning can tell you more about lemmatization or whatever, where plurals can be ignored and things like this, homosexuality, right, blah, blah. So there's um, topics again, and of course this is a big thing, so you can dive into this in more detail. So this time we managed to get better results. Um, of course, this is from a different run, so it's gonna be slightly off, okay? So I'm gonna skip the, the you can do exactly the same LDA model with expectation maximization. This is the other approach. <coughs> Okay, so you can sort of look at this. And in the end, you basically have to visualize these results. You do some zipping of the stuff and you can nicely visualize the results, okay, using some D3. And that's basically what's shown here from the previous one. So it looks like, um, I don't know, um, Jewish, Israel killed people are in one group and um, president, um, Windows software card, Microsoft or in one group, space, NASA, launch, shuttle. I mean, so that seems reasonable, okay? And without doing too much work. And sorry for running a bit late. I think I already told you about uh, these things. So if you, you know, try to go through the sort of homework of improving it, maybe changing different parameters and playing with it. And if you're interested in this type of stuff, um, there are some projects there. And if you guys have trouble with uh, the community edition of Databricks, talk to each other. I mean, you can ask me too, but you know, the idea is that you're doing, you know, grow your own community, you know. Um, okay. Are there any, any questions to people for projects? You know, just email me and uh, you can, my, my landline, my home landline, home address, everything is on my web page. So don't come to my home without uh, calling me, you know, my wife is there. <laughs> Sorry, the deadline for project plan. Ideally, maybe by the end of the third week of break, which is like three weeks from now. So there's a three week break, right? Don't we have the next class next week? No. Yeah, this is the seventh week, right? So there's three more weeks of break. 
And after that, we have five more weeks, right? In those five weeks, uh, we will, what are we doing for the first week of break? Yeah. Um, we're doing graphics, I think, and then maybe deep learning. I don't know if people want to get into deep learning or, you know, we're going to just focus on the syntax and all the mechanics and distributing maybe Google's TensorFlow. Are people interested in that? Okay, because Siva is going to take the whole Udacity tutorial on TensorFlow then. That's, that's what he guaranteed, because I'm going to be busy. So, so you know, you, you can take it too. We can send you a link to the Udacity, Udacity's uh, Google's um, deep learning thing. And, you know, maybe we can even have like, a discussion and those who understand can just come in, because I don't know anything about it. Right? Um, and then the last thing is geospatial. The third week is geospatial, and toward the end of it, Dylan can do this project. And then the last two weeks will be the remaining people, right? So 20 to 30 minutes each. Is that clear? So you need to finish your whole project before the last two weeks. And if people are slacking, then you have to negotiate with each other who's going to go in, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right.